Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 35th episode of By the Bywater. Glad to be back with you. We hope uh, you're happy to be back with us. Um, it is uh, being recorded right now. As I mentioned before, sometimes when uh, certain matches of football happen, uh, things can get noisy outside. That game is apparently a little later, so we're doing this now so I can avoid the either the screams of despondency or the screams of happiness <laughs> coming in and infecting the recording. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so We'll see what the later day brings me. Anyway, uh, setting that aside... How, how has the year gone for you guys so far? Busy. Things mm. are things are getting pretty busy. Staffing season is like starting for television a little a little early. So who knows what the future holds? Your eventual showrunner position, which will happen, of yeah. course, yes, <laughs> somewhere along the line, quickly. So and then we can finish our way in. So yeah, consultants, y'all can consult. Okay, yeah. that's good. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll take you up on that. That yeah. sounds good. So, <laughs> Okay, but uh, we actually have, believe it or not, some news to report. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, <laughs> but right? it is something. <laughs> so uh, we might as well just plunge right into it. So, Jared, please do take it away. Well, we figured something had to happen, and it did. Amazon has finally given us something about the upcoming series. They're they're still basically telling us nothing, you know, nothing else beyond the title. (laughs) The show is now officially called Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, which was signaled by a formal title announcement video featuring what we're assuming is more with Clark as Galadriel, you know, speaking part of the ring poem over images of seeming landscapes combined with molten metal forming the title words. Beyond that, though, the announced synopsis reconfirms all earlier notes, set during the Second Age, involves Numenor, the of Sauron and so forth, though they might have mentioned the Last Alliance for the first time this time around. So we'll see. Yeah, there is uh, one other interesting bit of news. If you're in or near Milwaukee from August 19th to December 12th, the Hegarty Museum of Art is hosting a special exhibition called J.R.R. Tolkien, The Art of the Manuscript, which will be showcasing various items from the famed Marquette University collection of Tolkien's papers. Tickets on sale now. So something to consider. Hey. Yeah, no, it's one of those things I'm like, can I make it out there? Maybe I can. I've, well, I've got family in Milwaukee. I I suddenly feel the urge to go visit them. There you, know, you go, make yeah. It, make it a, like, Chicago trip and then just take the train up to Milwaukee for, you know, the day or something. Yeah, there's an idea. Yeah, you know, there are things. It's one of those things. I mean, uh, having Oriana and I having seen the, uh, the, the big formal Tolkien exhibition that was done a couple of years ago, right when we started the podcast, that was really lovely. Having this being focused on uh, pages from various manuscripts. Again, uh, very famously, uh, Marquette is where the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings manuscripts themselves are located, along with a couple of the other other stories he's done, like uh, Farmer Giles of Ham. Uh, this is, uh, you know, that's mostly stored away for scholars to use, so bringing that out, kind of cool. So yeah, that'd be a thing. Hopefully, if uh, we don't get a chance to go, maybe someone else can go and tell us about it. But let's talk about that title we have a title we have a title and nothing else we have else. something <laughs> and you know i made the case that uh this is however unintentionally made me think of the final section of the silmarillion which is of course called of the rings of power mm-hmm. and the third age even mm-hmm. though this is the second age but it's tolkienish <laughs> you know it's been used yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know what else they would call it, though, given what the... No, there's not, they're, they're not going to call it a Calabeth or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, God. Or, or the downfall of Numenor. No. No. You know, that, you know, like, that one gave it away. People complaining about spoilers or whatever. Yeah. Like, right? <laughs> Return of the King already took care of that as a title. Right? I mean, let's would, face it. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the thing, whatever it is about it, I mean, to my mind, the genius of it, for lack of a better term, and combined with the fact that that they're obviously, you know, with the voiceover, basically sort of making everyone think, hey, the opening bit of Fellowship of the Ring, which is where the basics of that story are outlined. Mm-hmm. So all you have to do is it doesn't even require you to be a reader. If you've only ever seen the films, you can be like, yeah, remember the beginning where Gladriel talks about the Rings of Power? Oh, right. Yeah. Boom. You know, smart, solid intro. There you yeah. go. It really works. So mm-hmm. good job, guys. It was funny seeing people being like, oh, we know. We know more about it and it's like no we don't no no you, you don't no we don't 
And that's, you know, that is what it is. But yeah. Mm. And the one other thing, too, is that if that is Morphid Clark doing that, yeah, nothing against Morphid Clark as an actress. But that voice is not Kate Blanche's voice. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not even something like, oh, that's not my Galadriel. It's like she sounds very childish in a way that is suitable for probably a lot of other characters. But Galadriel is supposed to have a very, I guess, imposing kind of voice, yeah. right. which Kate Blanchett has and Morbus Clark doesn't. Yeah. yeah, there's a certain resonance. Thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. More of a cello than a violin kind mm-hmm. of thing. <laughs> so maybe it's someone else. Maybe we're wrong. But, uh, you know, but uh, we will we'll have to wait and <laughs> it's see. It's Calabria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just screw up all our expectations. Yeah, no. Or it's one of the hobbits they're going to introduce or whatever they're doing. Who knows? Oh, right. <laughs> it's Sauron. Surprise. <laughs> oh, my God. Actual gender bending in a Tolkien property? I mean, if, we know they can do it. Mm, yeah. What if they did that? Set it up as sort of like Galadriel versus female formed Sauron. That might be kind of fun. The girls are fighting. Right? <laughs> I was about to say girl boss battle. What? Girl no, boss no, no, no. battle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a certain segment of the viewership I'm sure would absolutely love that. Well, we've got about a little over seven months to go. So, you know, bit by bit, the clock ticks down. We'll see something. But, you know, who knows when we'll actually see a trailer thing. Probably it's not for some time to come. But still, we got this. And they paid Douglas Trumbull however much money to come in and basically point and go like, yeah, you do that. So <laughs> the behind the scenes creation of the uh, of the trailer did look pretty cool, I have to say. Yeah, I just I. <sighs> I know these two have already heard those already, but like, why would you bring Douglas Trumbull on just for a thing where you basically do a close up shot of a bunch of metal being poured? Like getting, I don't know, getting John Williams to do your Folgers commercial or something. It's, <laughs> it's overkill. I hope they paid him a lot of money. I hope he's very happy, but it's like, it just feels like they wanted the name. Hmm. It did throw me off at first. I was thinking just sort of like, oh, okay, canyon somewhere. I wonder where that canyon is. And then things started happening. It was like, Hmm. So, you know, maybe, maybe maybe I'm the credulous audience that they needed to have. <laughs> so. It was for you alone, Ned. You were uh, just for you. I am I'm simple that way. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there we are. So we'll see if there's anything more to come in the uh, next, uh, next month or so. But in the meantime, it is time to turn to our main topic. It is Oriana's Choice. So please go right ahead. Floor is yours. <laughs> I've talked about this before on previous episodes where I have difficulty forming images in my mind from written text, which is why the Shire perhaps is so dear to me because it is perhaps the clearest vision of land in all of Middle Earth to me. I'm not saying that applies for everyone else, but you know, Tolkien is no slouch when it comes to describing a place. I mean, pages and pages describing trees and winding paths through woods and mountains and and whatnot. But there is a special care taken, not just to describe the Shire physically, there's actually a little less of that than I thought going back and rereading. But really, it's it's setting a mood, a, a vibe, if, if you will. <laughs> um, you know, from from a narrative perspective, it's essential to set the Shire up as as home, as a pl- as the place that is worth sacrificing for, worth giving up comfort and possibly even life for. But it also kind of serves as a peek into what Tolkien himself craved, which is sort of an agrarian, somewhat anarchic slash libertarian society where people just kind of live and let live for the most part, which isn't Mm -hmm. to say that the Shire is a utopia or even meant as a utopia. Tolkien says that much uh, of the hobbits in a 1954 letter, uh, quote, hobbits are not a utopian vision or recommended as an ideal in their own or any age. They, as all people and their situations, are an historical accident, as the elves point out to Frodo, and an impermanent one in the long view, end quote. So the land the land itself endures, but I found myself thinking, if the hobbits are no longer the inhabitants of this land, is it still the Shire as we know and love it? Or do they, by virtue of living there, as the elves did in Lothlorien, imbue it with the special qualities its author holds in such great esteem? So, like, the Shire itself is land that was part of the realm of Arnor. The hobbits turned up around 1600 years into the Third Age, uh, which sounds like a long time. Uh, You think of the hobbits as having been there forever, and the hobbits themselves think of that as well. But they've only been there for, what, 
1500 years or so. They were granted leave to settle there by the king. And here we kind of see Tolkien's what seems like his ideal form of government, a largely absent king and a whole group of people whose only real authority figure is the mayor who runs the postal service and is kind of the head of the sheriffs who are mostly there to corral wayward livestock. They're sort of the only thing approaching a police force, and there's only 12 of them for the whole of the Shire. The only real other authority figure we have is the Thane, who is now hereditarily a Took. Uh, And he's regarded as an authority figure, but in the day-to-day, it doesn't really mean much of anything. He's basically sort of, you know, the representative of the king. And because there is no king anymore, he just kind of hangs around. And if if they need to muster up an army, which, uh, you know, happens extremely rarely, he helps out with that. But what was interesting going back was, was seeing that the Shire is not only not industrialized, which obviously is kind of the key point of not just the Shire, but Middle Earth in general. But commerce within the Shire isn't really featured. Like Bilbo's party requires the ordering of lots of food and uh, presents from outside the Shire. So we know that commerce does exist within the Shire. Sam and his dad are employed by Bilbo and then Frodo. But we don't really get any specifics about that. Like, we don't know how they're paid. There, there are taverns and inns, but currency is not really mentioned. Like, presumably there are gold coins or whatnot, but it's just kind of like people drink at taverns, people stay at inns, presumably they pay for it, but there isn't much discussion of monetary policy in Middle Earth or the Shire, <laughs> which is for the best. But um, <laughs> even Bilbo and Frodo themselves, Bilbo, before he went on his adventure in The Hobbit, were not really clear what kind of living he makes. You know, Fro- Bilbo tells Frodo, there's always been a Baggins at Bag End. Uh, which kind of feels like Bilbo and Frodo are landlords, I suppose. There are farmers and coopers and innkeepers and brewers and millers and barmaids, and someone is making the cutlery and the clothing and the parasols that Tolkien later was like, actually, that's a mistake. I really should not have 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 had anyone <laughs> anyone having parasols that's pretty anachronistic so it's it, it's this lovely fantasy where people seem to have occupations rather than job jobs in the way that we think of it in our modern way there's almost no need to bring money into it and i think that really really helps with the sense of the shire as home and not utopia but rather a a pleasant place to live and stay. So before we get too deep into other details, I got to ask you guys, what what do you think you would do in the Shire? Like what would you what would your occupation be? Weird uncle. Weird uncle. <laughs> <laughs> You are you are the Bilbo. You're yeah. like you just kind of exist and have money even before you go on an adventure. Like where did Bilbo's wealth come from? I get it doesn't matter. It does not matter. I, I really want to stress this, but it is fun to think about sometimes. <laughs> Rum running. Uh no, uh, more is seriously. That- uh, <laughs> you never know. Uh as for me, I mean, you know, <laughs> Jared's kind of right. I mean, this is the bias, of course, of the narrator. Basically, Bilbo and Frodo when he's there seem to have such the perfect life it's like who wouldn't want to be there i mean right? come on i mean that's part of the that's part of the uh, sort of addiction to it but uh, there are hints of you know other lives and things that happen in the shire i don't know like you know i like that we that even in such a small place as the shire we don't know and don't see everything about it right and that leads to sort of you know interesting mysteries about what can happen there i like for instance the fact that we have the uh, uncle of sam who's a rope walker is yeah. that what he does all day? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, you don't get a sense of librarians <laughs> in, in the show. It's a little so, odd, not. honestly. You would think, I guess because the the, hub, the hobbits are not a super literary society. Mm. It's super interesting to me that they don't, they aren't a, like a literary society. They don't have a ton of books, but they keep such close track mm-hmm. of relatives. Yeah. Like if there is a librarian there. It's going to be actually a genealogist, yeah. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. It's like a, it, it's like you know that uh, it, it's it's an or, almost an oral history type thing combined with a yeah. notification. It's like okay, we know that this is the uncle who did this, or this is the one who went to see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like as you can see in the appendices, part of the joy of the appendices are all these little sort of hints and bits of other mm-hmm. other Shire life that uh, that uh, that Tolkien creates. Um, but yeah, yeah, no. To answer your question. 
I don't know, Oriana. That's a really <laughs> that's a really good one. It's sort of like I I would stick out like a sore thumb. I think I'd have to be the weird uncle because nothing else quite suits me. <laughs> you t- you you know they've got a high proportion of just weird uncles lying around. Yeah, like it's that's gotta be <laughs> pretty much all of the proud feats. I feel like are are all. Are all weird uncles. Um. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this says something to the, hard to say, protean nature of the Shire, but to a degree, the fact that both Jared and I certainly, you know, responding to the idea of this sort of, dare I say, an idealized, comfortable, and for frankly, male fantasy of, ah, place sure. of one's own, <laughs> <laughs> and all that. So, and uh, from that framing where you're just sort of like, you know, no expectations and nothing seems to be asked of you. That's so. true. No, no wife, no, you know, you don't even take care of the garden unless you really want to talk with the gaffer about potatoes for yeah. a little, a little while, probably longer than you want. Yeah. You just, you have tea, you make baked goods every now and then. And, um, that's kind of it. It does sound like I know Tolkien specifically says this is not supposed to be a utopia, but I mean, it kind of sounds it, it's yeah like it would be. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's what sometimes you got to take everything an author says about their work with a grain of salt. Sure. I think because, mm. you know, not everybody's going to be accurate about their own work. But I think sometimes when he um, when he says something is not this or is this a lot of the time, given what it actually comes across as it's just this. It wasn't meant to be. Mm-hmm. He's saying he's saying it's not, but it's really it, it wasn't meant to be utopia, but it it is right. Yeah, it has problems, and I think maybe he was thinking, oh, it, I'm not intentionally writing the ideal society, but it is, it's so idealized. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody is just drinking beer or farming or whatever, and there's like the petty small town gossip kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. There's unhappiness in the Shire and all that, but it's still, it's a utopia. <laughs> right. It right. is it, kind of the ideal society because of the problems that it does have that are quite small in, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, no one loves being the object of or the subject of of gossip but uh i don't know oh if people think i'm kind of a weirdo because i have lots of money i that's fine that's a problem i'm willing to have I, yeah <laughs> yeah well i think one of the reasons it is an idealized society is that its biggest problems come from outside mm-hmm. mm. Mm. it doesn't it isn't being torn apart by like tensions between the brandy bucks and the toques or whatever it's every threat to the shire is external mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which i think is a defining characteristic of a utopia mm-hmm. i could be wrong but you know although ironically you know you, you could turn that around and say part of what you know breaks the you know seeming utopia of the shire to the point where it must be scoured is uh, something caused initially by uh, by lotho pimple yeah. in other words he was the sort of like you know in on the inside so there's a sense that you know you could you could corrupt, if you will, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, you the, can you, you can corrupt the Shire. I just think it's like he 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 was in contact with Saruman and a lot before this all happened. Like he's been, right. I think I think the implication is that he's been corrupted. So yeah, yeah, and then and then the the other thing about it, of course, is that uh, again it's external, and as the book makes clear, um, the reason why the outside threats really haven't come in for a while is because Gandalf and the Dunedain have been like, let's <laughs> make sure they're not troubled by them in the first place, yeah. even though they don't know. Which is that's a that's a heck of a long game to play if you're not if you're not yeah. uh, dedicated to that and it's shown to be it's shown to be good but uh, that it was that it, that that's the way it happened but it says a lot that uh, that this is not just some sort of place where you magically come in and everything's like ah and it's like no no it's it's actually shielded it's guarded mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. Uh, it's an invisible guard or rather it's invisible to the people there yeah. <laughs> so I guess is the best way to put it I can't remember is there an indication anywhere how long the rangers have been guarding the shire i know it's got to be somewhere it's i know he wrote this down somewhere but it, right <laughs> but is it public i I, I, can't. I think the idea is that is that uh is that it's been it hasn't been like forever and ever obviously so uh, it is something that gandalf does specifically say hmm, we need to keep a closer watch on it almost as if he's reacting to outside circumstances like ah, mm-hmm. oh, geez people are starting to pay a little more attention to the shire like you get the sense of threats or spies or whatever mm-hmm. so it's sort of like let's sort of up the watch and uh mm-hmm. and uh we 
we know about the the Brandywine Bridge and the uh, the the guards, the the Buckland guards that are there. Um, but there's no gate or anything like that. So whatever's there is sort of implied. But then there's Sarn Ford and everything. Is that Sarn Ford? The, the the very the the Ford at the very south part of the Shire, which seems like is the other main way that people can get into the Shire, and that's specifically said to be uh, where the Rangers have a very close watch. And uh, and uh, where where forces come in, and where when the Black Riders arrive, they drive them away precisely so they can come into the Shire that way. So so uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of the question there in terms of how long though. Yeah, I think it's again fairly recent because. There are bits of history of the Shire that shows it hasn't been just completely sunshine and roses. They refer to, uh, they refer to uh, the uh, there's the, the pestilence that comes through at one time that's supposed to wipes out Gondor heavily, and at least two very hard winters. One mm-hmm. of which uh, leads to the invasion of wolves in the Shire, and then there's also at least one band of orcs that comes in that leads, of course, to the golf joke in the Hobbit. <laughs> so, which you know, it's canon. <laughs> It's it's interesting again. This sort of like it, it's almost like Tolkien wants to set up some details, but he's not giving you much because to add to it would just sort of almost destroy the fantasy in a weird sort of way. Mm-hmm. It, it does. Uh, start asking too many questions about what's the tax policy right. or whatever. Like who is actually in charge and why? Why do things? work without any actual central authority mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like the implication is that the families kind of keep everyone in line yeah mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. because they're so obsessed with genealogy and who's related to who who's descended from whom and that kind of thing like the Tooks have their own like the, the Thane is the head of the Tooks mm-hmm. or no it's a separate office but it tends to be the same thing yeah mm-hmm. the Brandy Bucks have you know the whatever the what's what's he called the old buck no that's the old family name oh the, the master of Brandy Hall yeah yes mm-hmm. and Buckland yeah and the, the Baganses have their own leader and all that like they all they're just like mini polities Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of Ireland in you know before the the English colonization. I was going to say Scotland, but yeah, it's, Did a, it like, simil- it's a similar thing. Basically, yeah. the same thing happened to both. <laughs> where and it was only by you know the English being like, if you pledge yourselves to us, we'll give you your lands. Like keep that, and we won't bother you. Just follow English rule and pay us taxes. And they were like, yeah, all right. Like, you know, a fair, a fair <laughs> number, of fair. Them, a fair number what of could them, go wrong? right? Like, so I do, that is kind of funny to think about the Brandy Bucks doing that uh, way back in the day. Like, oh yeah, okay, we'll, we'll pledge our allegiance, whatever you can use us for, fine, I guess. We'll send you some archers once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that maybe in a bit. But uh, to talk about the point about work, I mean, I like I like the the moments where you where it's indicated that, you know, someone someone's someone's asking someone to do something and it's expected they'll do it. Mm-hmm. And those moments are rare, but they're there. The two I can think of one near the beginning, one at the end is after the after the big party that talks about, you know, so, you know, most people slept in. Some people came by orders <laughs> to do that. So someone did the ordering <laughs> to, to clear things up and things had to be delivered and take people away in wheelbarrows and all that that would be my occupation the bouncers of hobbiton who are they <laughs> that's so funny the party cleanup crew the party cleanup crew like yeah i'll take all the leftovers or very rare and and eat those and then wheel the Drunk hobbits away. It sounds great. And then near the end of the book, uh, this helps since I did do the recent, not rereading, but relisting. I did finish to Andy Serkis's reading Lord of the Rings mm. again. Very good. Um, talking about uh, talking about how at the end uh, in you know 1420, the glorious year when everything recovers, and talking about uh, as everyone was happy, it's like you know everyone was content except those who had to mow the grass. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> implying that someone had to mow the grass, Which, and maybe okay. they had to- <laughs> that sentence is another parasol equivalent to me because why do the hobbits want to mow the grass who taught them who inspired this idea that of a lawn first of all and second of all like that it must be like kept short i'm i'm so curious I mean, I think there's two possibilities. One is that somebody's got to keep the golf courses clean. <gasps> That's and right. And the other, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank right. you. <laughs> Literally, it could just be some of it is just haying. Like you've got to, yeah. you've got to cut down the grass. And if there's so much of it, I mean, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. But like whatever. Although lawns have a really long history, though. I mean, it's not. I don't think it's un. Uh, what is not? I almost said unweird. It's not. <laughs> 
It makes sense to me that the hobbits would have invented lawns because they are very. They're not. They're not like into. They're, they have. They definitely have HOAs. I, like, okay, I was just gonna say, do the hobbits have HOAs? And it's I think the whole right. owners association, like the hill, the hill owners association. <laughs> Hobbit Hole Owner Association, you can cover all bases, so. <laughs> that that actually does sound like, because they do love rules. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense. You have to create some rules about, you know, things being kind of orderly. It's funny the mention about the anachronism of lawns. That led to, that led to an issue of cultural portrayal, let's say, and that will mm-hmm. lead me to expand on a further point. But uh, uh, a favorite bit of mine from a series of uh, a series of uh, uh, comics, or however you want to describe them, that I've dearly loved are the Asterisk uh, uh, comics uh, from France, <laughs> yeah. which, of course, are basically just a one series of amazing, just ridiculous jokes and ES puns. <clears throat> Mr. Petrachek. <laughs> so, what? Uh, after- I don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. Lies. Um, let's see. So uh, that, that was for Eric Heider, who I know is listening, and you'll appreciate it. A bastard. Anyway, moving yeah. on. <laughs> So moving on from that, uh, the uh, the uh, the the thing uh, the thing about asterisk is that of course uh, they're the incredible parodies of essentially post World War II Europe uh, and characters and things like that. And there's an episode where asterisk goes to England, and one of the things that they have with the English system is carrying the lawn. Mm-hmm. And like there's this one like English guy who like immediately stops a bunch of centurions crossing the lawn because asterisk and you know and Obelix have already torn across the lawn and messed it up. And he's sort of like, nope, you're not going further. Mm-hmm. The lawn's messed up as much as it is. So the lawn being a big thing there. But um, I could go on about the jokes in that. Wonderful. I'm sure there are podcasts about that. But stepping back, this idea of what an England is supposed to be like, Mm -hmm. and we're talking Mm -hmm. about it not being utopic, but again, if uh, regardless of what it is, you know, if Tolkien had been from somewhere else than something else, maybe his vision utopia term, but he is English, and therefore he frames it in England, and that leads to the concept of what can be called, and you can look it up in Wikipedia if you need a starting point, Merry England, which is mm-hmm. this perceived never-never of an England where everything was happy and content and was kind of like the England that we see implicitly portrayed in the Shire. The Shire is the Shire, which when I was a kid, that meant nothing to me. It was like, oh, okay, that's a cool name. It's only later I'm like, oh, in England they call them Shire. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. You know, you, you learn about this, and uh, similarly, uh, the uh, the idealized life of what uh, Mary England is supposed to be like. You know, just comfortable landed gentry. There's your pub, the farm, things like this. This is all that, and this image of what uh, what uh, what an idealized England, a little England, is supposed to be like uh, in the countryside or just you know very small towns um, has one been around for hundreds of years. It's an eternal chimeric fantasy, essentially. You know, it was always mm-hmm. better in the past. Yeah, it was always calmer in the past despite all the wars or whatever else might have been happening to and things like that. And, uh, and, uh, it's, uh, we see, we see examples of it to the present day <clears throat> Brexit. So this idea that mm-hmm. there's this homeland meant to be preserved and it's a powerful image and it's a stultifying one too, at the same time. Uh, there's a lot more I could sort of add to that. I don't want to completely go skew with off, but one thing maybe sort of come around from that to bring it back to discussion is how much of the Shire, how much of the Shire for all its idealized things, so we're like, wouldn't well, be nice. How much of it is parody and satire mm-hmm. of a people in a mindset? And I would say a huge amount. Oh, for sure, massively. Yes. <laughs> so. I do wonder. Like, there is a like. So the hobbits themselves are quite clearly like a a loving parody. Would we say? Does mm-hmm. that does that sound accurate? Oh yeah. Of English folks, uh, you know the, the Englishmen in the country. Which is kind of distinct from the land itself, I feel like. Like, the land itself is pure love, pure, like, this is what England should look like always. We Like, you know, there should be some farms, there need to be woods, we need hills and clean streams and that kind of thing. So it is this funny little, like, like you know, we have this extremely idealized version of the land and the people who live on the land and are the reason it is the way it is. Are are this sort of loving parody or or satire? I find that interesting. I hadn't thought about that, so thank you, Ned. Yeah, you're welcome. Are they the reason though? I know they think they are, but the the Shire was originally just like a royal park, essentially. So True. it was tended and cared for. Yeah. And I I I wonder how much 
how much that feeds into like the Shire's perception of itself. Like they, they Maybe, don't even talk yeah. about, they don't, yeah. Amongst themselves, they're just like, yeah, we're, you know, hobbits, we're farming, we're awesome. And they don't really, I mean, it was, you know, 1500 years ago. They're not going to bring it up in every conversation and be like, <laughs> Hey, remember when our ancestors colonized this place? That was cool. <laughs> so, I mean, it makes sense, but like, are they in a sense taking credit for the work of mm. the people who were there before them? We're not taking credit. What am I trying to say? I mean, kind of. I think that makes yeah. sense. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I see it. But I do wonder, like, it has been so long. Like, yeah, do the hobbits think of themselves as merely, you know, another kind of caretaker versus the sole, like, creators of this land and way of life? Mm-hmm. It feels like they have the attitude of, yeah, like, we, we did this, right? Mm. Yeah, you made this. I made this. <laughs> mm. It it is obviously an incredibly insular society as opposed to the land. The idea that mm-hmm. anyone who goes off and does something is seen to be a little weird. The uh, the most the most that it's almost allowed for are interestingly enough the Bucklanders who exist mm-hmm. in this sort of like interesting tension spot. You know, most of the rest of Shars are like ah those freaks, whereas yeah. whereas the Bucklanders themselves are sort of like you know they have their own thing. I, I love the the great response from uh, Farmer Maggot, wonderful character who although he's not in Buckland is nearby and is was said to be part of the well, the Marish who recognizes the authority of the Master of the Hall, so mm-hmm. he clearly identifies more with Buckland. And you know when Frodo and all that come through on the visit, you know at one point he says something. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, it's, you know, it's great you've come back here. It's not going up to Hobbiton. Folk are queer up there, which, of mm-hmm. course, is exactly yeah. what they're saying about I mean, it's it's this it's this incredible narcissism of small differences. But it's mm-hmm. also a reflection reflection of regional difference in, oh, in yeah. very in even small places. I mean, all three of us could name examples uh, just from where we're at and where we've been in terms of our lives and things like that. So it just can be it can People be in easy. Auburn have fridges in their front yard. That kind of thing. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like 20 miles south of Seattle, it's like, oh, they're all rednecks down there. You know, mm-hmm. Not really, but, you know, that's how it is. Right, right. Those stereotypes are, are real. And, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, we, we see it here. Sort of building on... Your your point there about uh, about uh, the land, uh, Oriana, and the and the differences in this idea of sort of what coming in. There is this sense of we sort of and slightly returning to the point that the hobbits do have a sense of of history and knowledge, but it's only so far. Yeah, it's 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 like they they don't treat things as folklore necessarily, but they also don't treat them as deeply important. <laughs> I guess is the best way yeah. to put it. I feel like it's it, it ties into the genealogy thing where they're so focused on the people themselves rather than what the people did like that you know uh, except at a very surface level like well it's very navel gazy they're only interested in what hobbits are doing what they were doing and like even then it kind of feels like they aren't interested in their ancestors as people or even like all of the things that they did it feels like a very incomplete log of of Mm -hmm. what actually happened um and part of that is because it's so it's so narrowly focused on only Shire business, of which there is seldom too much. Uh, <laughs> and some of that is just, I think, like, yeah, kind of a lack of interest in or a, a more interest in just getting names and dates instead of who these people are and the fullness of their lives. There's maybe a, you know, how much biography do we always want to bring in with these things <laughs> like this? But in uh, in this case, I think Tolkien in his depiction of, of the hobbits from a Frodo-specific point of view, um, and more than anything else, is sort of like, you know, he, he's allowing for the fact that there will be some who, with some sense of foreknowledge or not, will actually go out and do things. And that's exactly what happens. Four hobbits go and have a massive world world-changing adventure, and come back to a recognition that is conditioned at best, uh, as, as the book <laughs> says. Uh, Mary and Pippin get most of the attention uh, after they come back and everything's settled, because they get to be the, they're the young lordlings. They are the young lordlings. It's it's something that doesn't uh, score. They are the ones who are going to inherit these positions over yeah. time as Master and uh, and, and, uh, and Thane. Uh, so it's sort of like, hey, wow, get a load of them. You know, it's sort of like, oh, you went to crazy weird places. I never want to go there, but goodness, you know, that's the sort of reaction. You sure look nice. You got some pretty clothes out yeah. of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and doing stuff and uh, of course you know they they do great deeds in the scouring as such so but the whole this whole sense of 
frustration, you could say, on the part of, uh, I think it's Frodo in particular who says something like, he says the line, right? It's like, you know, I had to, he's, it's like, I've often thought it'd be good. To, what's mm-hmm. the exact line? So it's something good that they go on an adventure or have a thing, you know? That, that, yeah, so it'd be good for them to have like a dragon yeah, invasion or something like yeah, that. I've yeah. often thought that. Yeah, which he says before he does anything. Yeah. It's in like the second chapter yeah. and Gandalf's like, uh, <laughs> you don't know what <laughs> you you're talking no about. <laughs> don't ask for that. And then, and then Gandalf himself, you know, it's, 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 sort of this this almost you know loving recognition of their insularity mm-hmm. and at the same time it's sort of like it makes you wonder is like can you cuddle them too much where he says oh it'd be so terrible if all you ridiculous as boffins and mm-hmm. this is like you all became slaves it's sort yeah. of like well that ramped it up yeah. <laughs> that escalated quickly yeah <laughs> <laughs> it is it is interesting like every once in a while I'll stumble across a a, a strange to me subculture on the internet like uh, there was like the air traffic controller like sort of Facebook groups and meme groups and whatnot that were sort of brought to people's attention sort of the you know the wider internet discovered that air traffic controllers have these meme groups and like hmm. I just felt such a such a fondness for them, like such a and I was like, ooh, is this like kind of the patronizing attitude that like Gandalf and the Dunedain have for the hobbits? Like, am I am I falling into that mindset? <laughs> You can say so. Sorry, now I'm just wondering what a Hobbit meme group would be like. Like people from Buckland to be oh like, oh my god, a <laughs> Hobbit stand up. <laughs> Sam has a tight five. What is the deal with Bucklanders swimming? Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? And those ones from Bree, don't get me started. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Tip Parliament at the end. And it's only the really offensive imitations of Bree accents. Tip them with what? Well, you see, here's the thing. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember, remember your your point about money again is incredibly well observed. Remember how there's the point where uh in Bree where they're there and uh they arrive there at the Prancy Pony, Aragorn appears in the drawing room and sort of like, you know, and I will ask a favor. And what would that be, Bree? And Frodo's like, I didn't bring much money with me and like so you've got some I'm like the the ponies are like a few silver pennies and stuff so like it does exist although but like it is funny to me that that happens in Bree specifically right. and not the shire no there's no clinking of coins I, I i only thought about it because i remember reading all sorts of other fantasy books uh in my teens that had a kind of preoccupation with money and and that sort of like level of detail like oh well like 50 gold pieces yeah, or I whatever need to, you know oh well we had like oh this region has this money and and this region has this money and and we have to like figure out a way to to do that or add they you know have they come up with a special name for the money but that isn't really the case here he just uses you know basically like silver pennies basically uh words that we already know and i do appreciate that i it it really because no one wants to worry about money i like you know i'm bringing it up here just because it's kind of funny but yeah you don't really want to think i don't want to be thinking about that when we're having these adventures yeah i think the only the only real mention of money in the Shire is when I think it's when Gandalf arrives for the party and Bilbo gives away like a few pennies or something to the little mm-hmm. hobbit kids that are gathered around. And that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they must be paying for something somehow. But yeah, I don't I don't want to know. Like, right. Oh, it, a beer in in Bywater costs this much and a beer at the green at the floating log or whatever it is costs this. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't need to know that. Yeah, I don't need Tolkien to tell me, OK, Frodo paid the tab for the table, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we do we do get a sense again of how money can work at the end of the scouring when they're learning well, what happened here when they come back. Right. And they talk about a little thing. Well, you know, initially they bought for things or they paid for damages or whatever. So we're like, OK, something happening but then that just goes away entirely and yep. then it just becomes brute control which in some respects makes it easier for Tolkien to talk about because right. it's sort of like you know mm, where's that you know it's sort of like and that is interesting too thinking more about how you know evil in the Shire works it's it's very light but it's there like you know for instance at the end when the when the when the band of sheriffs comes up to uh, try and apprehend the uh, the hobbits at uh, at uh, at I think it's at Bywater or, or crew or whatever, when it's just them not the ruffians but the other things like this basically it talks about how most of them join the rebellion, but uh, then some just sort of slink away. It's sort of like, what happened to them? You know, hmm. are they? Is there? Are they talked about? 
Did we get some names? You know, there's this sort of like the sense of, you know, there's clearly, you know, there they, they're mentions that, but they're not dwelled on. Mm-hmm. Is mm-hmm. interesting. It, it's it's sort of like, oh yeah, that happened. Cough, cough. Yeah. But you know, we're not gonna yeah. we're not gonna talk about vengeance. You know, it's sort of like you know anyone again. You know, the World War II comparisons. Here we go. But you know, we the, the story about what happened to received as collaborators, etc., and all that was no small thing mm-hmm. in Europe mm-hmm. after the war was over. So it's it's one of those sort of like hmm, type things. So. Yeah. yeah, the fact that Frodo is the narrator of that section and he's explicitly it, trying to avoid damaging the Shire further by. I don't know, fomenting tensions among hobbits yeah. and all that. I really mm-hmm. feel like he was like, as a historian, I've got to record that this happened, but I'm not going to say anything more than that. <laughs> like, whatever <laughs> yeah. happened to them after that, whatever the reaction among yeah. the larger Shire population was to the collaborators, he's just not going to talk about it because he doesn't want it to be remembered. <laughs> Which is, mm-hmm. like, that's one way to go about it. It's, it's, it, it is, is interesting. It's, like, it, it, well, and like, it, you know, it tells you a lot about Frodo and... It is. I do think it's also really great that the the way that the, you knew things were getting bad in the Shire was when the sheriffs there there started to be more of them. Like yeah. Tolkien said, defund, <laughs> defund the police. The, the sheriffs and also the concentration of land and wealth yep. mm-hmm. under mm-hmm. specific people, rather than I mean, they're already you know. The, the great families already own a ton of stuff, yeah. which is which is apparently OK. But it, it's when one family tries to get greedy and take over more than that, like Lotho does, that it's like, OK, this is a problem. Ancestral wealth is fine. To destroy what was already there, too, and turn it into something else. I think that it's this interesting tension between and when I say conservative, I mean the literal act of conserving mm-hmm. what yeah. is already yeah. there of conservatism versus like versus shit. a kind of a kind of progress yeah. like mm-hmm. like yeah. progress relies on this is I, a specific kind of progress relies on destroying what's already there and making something else, whether it's better or not, who knows if you sell it is better. It might have like, you know, the Elon Musk with the tunnel thing, like that's a certain oh, kind boy. of air quotes, progressive thing to do, but it's like, it doesn't fix anything. It's just improving for the sake of improvement and it doesn't work. Right. Which is no. Yeah. That's very, very true. I'm sorry to have to interrupt. Uh, you remind me of something I'm holding up my copy of the book. So my co-host can see it, but this is John Garth's fairly recent book, the worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien, which is specifically about the geography that inspired middle earth. And, and a map in it, I found was very interesting, which again, I'm going to hold up for their consideration. I'll try and maybe do a scan or something mm. like that is these are locations around Birmingham where, uh, mm-hmm. where Tolkien lived when he was a kid. And the one that's right here, which is the one that the actual outskirts, Sarah hole as you can see, mm-hmm. compared to all the other ones, was an actual one that was actually on the fringes of the city at the time. Yeah. So you get a sense of how uh, how when he was a young boy, and he talks about this, of course, in the introduction, as compared to the other spots that were much more urbanized in living in Birmingham, is sort of like there's an actual, okay, you know, the mill of his youth, you know, yeah. even though, as he mm-hmm. says, you know, the mill owner was not named Sandy Man. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and those local, and that sense of something that even now, of course, you know, now that the urban expansion is what it is and the book I feel indicates that you know that area is now you know in a, it, you're pretty much you know t- totally transformed. So you do get the sense that uh, that uh, Tolkien is you know we're this idealized coming back again to the Merry England thing again. Mm-hmm. This uh, sense of this idealized place was very tangible still for him and still was tangible in this late Victorian Edwardian era. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, you know the the introduction of you know the introduction of uh, the railroads were long established at that point. Only mm-hmm. the oldest people in England around the 1890s would have, uh, would have, you know, 60s, 70s and up, would have remembered the time before railroads. And cars were only just introduced. So it's just just on the, you know, the sense of, and to tying the sense of progress, you know, what is progress? What mm-hmm. is acceptable? You know, what will we allow? Mm-hmm. There's obviously no railroad or anything truly industrial, anything like that in the Shire. So, mm-hmm. you know, Tolkien's reaching back even further. But this sense of... Uh, the sense of, you know, just it's on the tip of your tongue, you know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. you can almost touch it with your fingers. Mm-hmm. And he remembers that when he was young. And by the time he's writing everything, that's long, you know, as with so much else, it's long, long gone. Shifting gears, maybe, though, to talk to about it, I mean, absolutely, one of my favorite sequences in Lord of the Rings, no question about it, is the extended chapters of the walk from Hobbiton to Crick Hollow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Strictly as a nature walk, every time I read through that, it's like, I am happy to be on this journey. Yeah. That is, that, that is, that is, it is, it is a beautiful picture of a 
walk that didn't exist in reality. Of mm-hmm. course, you know, that things. But Tolkien drew on his experience from just walks and things. And you're just like, I want to be on that trip. I really, really do. It's described so beautifully. Everything about it. I, I it, it is truly, it is truly idealized, but in the best way. I just, mm-hmm. I adore it. It's some of his best writing. That was actually the inspiration for choosing this topic. I often go back and and read that part of the story specifically as just kind of a little mood booster. Like it's, it's, you know, my own little personal SSRI, uh, (laughs) just, just reading that. And it's very calming, even though like the black writers are there. But just reading that and like having it capped off with uh, meeting the elves and the description of that evening at at Woodhall is just so lovely. Like I learned so many different nature words too. I <laughs> like I grew up. It wasn't total suburbia when my family moved to Central Florida. I was like four years old. It was still kind of swampy, backwatery. Uh, and was being built up. But my family was not like a huge nature outdoors type family. And so I I felt kind of impoverished by Mm -hmm. not having experienced that kind of scenery and having no words that to to really describe land or trees or or bowel or fauna. And Mm -hmm. so like learning all these, like a, like a ride, you know, not like riding in a car, but like a beautiful green ride was, it was very formative for me. It's funny. I, when I was a kid, I always just kind of not skimmed that part exactly, but I was trying to get over with like, stop, stop for the elves. Yeah. Stop for Farmer Maggot. But the rest of it is like, okay, this tree, I don't care. I don't care. All right, you're walking. You're walking. We know. (laughs) But then in the last couple years with having to like be inside all the time Mm -hmm. or be either be inside by yourself or be outside for some reason, those chapters are now or that chapter or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. was like, oh, my God, it's so nice just to be outside in this place with people and not worry about anything, even though it's clear. You know, it's not real. I, I swear I can distinguish fantasy from reality. Of course. But, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just I, I appreciate those more now than I ever thought I would. Mm-hmm. Just just like this little walk through the nettles or whatever. Like, yeah, right. Yeah. I, I love I love springy Heather and, and yeah. you know, yeah. looking down into valleys, which, again, as someone who grew up in the flattest state in America, or if not, or one of the flattest states in America, pretty, isn't the highest point like a boulder somewhere? Yeah, like it's not <laughs> it's it's pretty. Yeah, I had never even really seen hills. Hadn't seen any mountains. I had to go off of like what I had seen in movies and and whatnot. And so like having this kind of long passage, you know, these passages about it, even though it was difficult for me to actually form the picture in my mind, the words just really resonated with me, um, even though I couldn't form the pictures in my mind as completely as other people can. Hmm. For me, uh, I, uh, whether it was just because involved with scouting or just, you know, my dad being my dad and all that, always been a great uh, a hiker uh, guy for uh, the mountains. And so when I was younger, my sis sort of says, taking this, took this over in more recent decades. But uh, for the, my, let's say my first two decades, uh, going out and doing camping trips, either with my dad or with a larger group, including my dad, was fairly common in both uh, California and upstate New York uh, when I lived there. And so for me, uh, that type of feeling, uh, was uh, yeah, lots of elevations, <laughs> so, you know, way, way, way more than you ever had, Oriana. I can tell you that already. You're, you're described as flat upper game. It's like, nope, it's not me. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up there, and I didn't grow up in the Midwest. No, for me, it's 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 definitely going up and down a lot of things. But uh, but the joy of that. So this this is something that is different from that again, of course, because there is it, it's undulating. There's a sense of like you know the things, and the, and there's a variety in the landscape too. And of course, well, there's some roads. Some of it is not road uh, off road mm-hmm. stuff, literally. And they're talking about as. Eh, is that a good idea? Should we do that? Um, and you do get a sense of sort of like, you know, the sense of past conversations. And it's not maybe so much the Shire as it is just engaging with nature, but it's because it is the Shire that you get a sense that it's supposed to be, oh, whatever we do, whatever will happen, it'll be fine. Up until when the Black Riders show up, mm-hmm. then it's sort of like, yeah, <laughs> and then things get a little more. T- oh, no, there's something in the soft play area. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Pretty much. But, uh, but, uh, but stepping back, yeah, among other things, like, for instance, those moments of when the rains come or when they're camped mm-hmm. out inside a hollow tree or all these other things are just sort of like, ah, so nice. And even, even something so great as when, uh, when Frodo gets up with a cricket, a cricket in his back, whatever, it's like, ah, walking for pleasure. Why didn't I drive? <laughs> you know? yeah. It's like, yeah. As someone who has, you know, woken up in tents, mind you, but you're getting at your sort of like, oh boy. Oh you know, boy. All that. I, oh, yeah. I'm doing this for fun. There was, my husband and I went out to Joshua Tree and camped for only one night. Um, and it was beautiful, but uh, it was a full moon. And I did not Ooh. realize the moon is extremely bright. It oh, was yeah. daylight, basically. I don't know if it was like a super full moon or what, but like I woke up at around two in the morning and the moonlight was just right directly into my eye. There was like, a, you know, a mesh part of the tent that, that mm-hmm. wasn't blocking the light. And I was like, Holy shit! I'm not, I'm not sleeping anymore tonight. At least not until the moon moves away. Question mark. Uh, and I was like, Oh god, we're getting a hotel next time. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah, even but, it, but that makes the quotidian complaint so perfect because it is just sort of like you know, it, at that point, at that point, it is an easy ramble. They know they're you know, Volfrodo and thinking about is going like, well, I have to tell him at some point and meet up with Gandalf, maybe a brief, whatever. But you know, then it all. It all compounds from there. One of my other favorite, very small little moments um, happens around that earlier part of it, too, when the three of them are asleep. And what do we get but a talking a fox. fox? Yeah, the fox. <laughs> I love the little fox. Fox is great. It just says like it's it's almost a watership down moment, or maybe more accurately, the plague dogs, since there's a fox in that one. Much different circumstance, I should note. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I just love this little talking fox that comes in and says something. Oh, hobbits, how weird! And I'm like, what's your story? Yeah. Do the other animals in the Shire talk? What's going right. on? <laughs> Is that is that like a C.S. Lewis shout out? Like yeah, know, this is before Narnia. <laughs> oh yeah, the talking fox. But somebody in the Megavonic Slack. I don't think she's on any of our podcasts, but she's like a friend of the network. Um, yes, points out that that the talking fox thing is set is placed in the part of the book that Bilbo has written, and mm. it's a very Bilbo thing to do. Like that that would not be out of place in The Hobbit, you right. know. Yeah. And then when Frodo takes over, all of a sudden the narration is much more matter of fact and there's no talking foxes and no no animals are wondering anything mm-hmm. about anybody. But yeah, it's such a cute moment. It and is. It's like that's the, that's the last bit of cuteness for a while. It is. I will <laughs> yeah. say, it does say he thought. So technically the fox does not speak. Um, I will. I could have sworn it said he said to himself, but I know it's it. It's weird because it's in it's in it's all in quotations. Um, but it does say he thought. So I guess we can let that slide. But it does feel very Bilbo-y. So that that totally makes sense. I forget about that sometimes. I forget that, like, yes, different people have written different parts of this, or you know, quote unquote. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good, that's a good argument. I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> pardon, pardon me. And but it one is other just thing. a lovely little moment, Ned. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it just it, I, I I adore it. And um, another part of the overall journey, Kador. I mean, Woodhall is wonderful. I mean, the whole sequence wow. with the elves is just you know you, you get a sense of something. It's it's clearly something that uh, this sense of you have walked through areas that you've known before and all that, but then someone else comes on and introduces you to something you didn't know about mm-hmm. or didn't appreciate or didn't fully understand, and all of a sudden your view of it completely changes around. I love the contrast between them out there on that clearing up above the cliffside where you can look down and you can see the little uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 nearby town, mm-hmm. and you see the little lights and things down there, and in normal circumstances maybe that's where they might have gone for the night or things like this, but instead they're up here and they're watching, you know, and oh, oh boy, you know, the, 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 the eternal astronomy buff in me, just, you know, the, the description of the stars coming out and then the lights coming under just like, you know, uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's idealized, but what an idealization. <laughs> so marvelous. It's just so nice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and uh, and then the other part of decision that uh, really hits in is a lovely spot, and it's one of those things like you could almost imagine a part of the story just ending here. And part of me was always disappointed. It's like why couldn't they have stayed the night? And that is when they get to Crick Hollow. Yep. Oh and yeah. When they get to Buckland, because of course it's it's very you know it's very tense. We've got the worries about the Black Riders. They they get to the ferry, they get across, they realize that the Black Riders right have been so far away the whole time. It's sort of like Ugh. so they get themselves away. They get they get away. I do love you know it's a very Tolkien move. And another writer, we would have gotten to Brandy Hall. 
We would have mm-hmm. gone inside, seen the many holes in Warrens, gotten a sense of how it is. Instead, we just this outside description of this magnificent mansion, which is a hill <laughs> that uh, we get, and it's just, it's a lovely description. But we're still we're moving through Buckland in the nights. There's you know he's, he's telling a little bit of history about it, and then we get to Crick Hollow, and Crick Hollow is so cozy. And so perfect. And it's sort of like, it was a place as weekend retreat. And I'm like, yeah, go on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and a bath, of course. Three baths. Because they're not uncivilized. <laughs> yeah. That whole sequence is so just warm and just like it, it's, it's, a, he, it's such a good setting up of, you know, the contrast to come and mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. just like, this is, this is what we're doing this all for this is why we're bothering yeah. it's very effective shout out to freddy uh, fatty bulger bulger yeah we love fatty i love fatty he's such a dear mm-hmm. so good he does like one thing but he does it so well and he does it so well yeah he runs off to warn the bucklanders and he's so he's a good boy there are there's so many of the hobbits are good boys that's one of the best things about the shire the sheer percentage that's true yeah he's in the little jails and they risk him out and he's so like you know and they, he can't he can't get over this how mary and pippin have grown what's your size in hats now <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the size in hats thing is hilarious to me like because I forget that hats come in sizes. Uh, <laughs> like, that wouldn't have been my, the article of clothing that I chose. It was Fatty's, and I love that about him. I mean, you know, clearly when everyone comes back, it's something about comments about their clothes. I mean, the great comment from, you know, the from the gaffer, you know, what's come of his waistcoat? I don't hold with Iron Mongery whether it wears well or no. <laughs> what a what a great line. So, I mean, yeah, the, the Shire is... It's 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 more complicated than it seems to be on first mm-hmm. blush, and yet at the mm-hmm. same time is so almost seductively simple. It really mm-hmm. is. It's uh, it's a land of contrast. But more Ooh. seriously, it is <laughs> it is one of those things where Tolkien is relying on relying on both you could say stock characterizations, but a certain sense of place and self to draw on, and also just not making it be. Completely perfect. I mean, in yeah. some respects, that's what the scouring, which of course we spent an episode on already, uh, it means in some respects to to contrast uh, to, to contrast the two, and of course what that means and takes on that, and, and one can go on. I do sort of wonder, bringing up different narrators and all that, and the idealization and all that kind of thing, is how much of it is intentionally the the in story authors of the book, mm. Um, mm. not necessarily idealizing the Shire exactly, but re- wanting to portray it as they wanted it to be. Mm. Mm. Good point. Not that it's untruthful in some respects right. or whatever, but like if you've been through a terrifying experience in your own land, mm-hmm. would you, how would how would that affect your portrayal of it? Yeah. In a in a chronicle, would yeah. you want to be like everything was fine until the invaders or, or whatever? Would <laughs> we only had the petty disputes, but that was fine because it was funny. And I don't hmm. I don't know I don't I don't think there's an answer. I'm just wondering if we're looking at what he intended as far as idealization and what the book is doing. Where's the division between the author and the narrator and yeah, all that? I find that I find that plausible that there is this element of editorial uh, or not, not, yeah <laughs> kind of not totally rose-colored glasses but a bit of that just induced by you know this like you love the trauma. shire so freaking much <laughs> that you want to believe that it was always this good or <laughs> so great make the shire great again just shire great again. Again. i was hoping none of you would say that <laughs> you're, you're leading you lead us down that primrose path so um well uh we we probably should wrap up at this point so oriana is the introducer of the topic uh what do you want to say in conclusion if anything so i feel like i didn't properly answer my own question i feel like i would be a barmaid in the shire and that's the end that's that's my final thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Barmaid of the Green Dragon, we heard it here. Right? <laughs> Okay, the time has come to look ahead to the next episode and our next topic. The choice of it has come around to Jared. What are we talking about next time? Oh, God. So I know this is this is two fairly big things in a row, I feel like. But this is the word that is on my spirit. <laughs> um, I do really want to talk about the Valar. Ooh, yes. Ooh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, it's this is I, this is going to be so wide ranging. I know it. It's going to be. There's a lot. There's a lot there, but we keep talking about them. But it's time to talk about them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go in big. So. Yeah. 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 I love this. I'm so excited. 
All right. Yeah, well, that'll be, you know, minor minor details, only the creation of the world and what came before it. <laughs> so, yep. And who who they are too. Like, who they are, yeah. what they're doing, why are what they doing it? Deal? What are they not doing? Mm-hmm. And why are they not doing it? Is almost the bigger question. Are they are they are they messing up all the time? Yeah, there's so much to so much to go over. Too much even, but we'll see. There's there's plenty of stories and boy, you so you certainly, yeah. yeah, and you certainly made me think. Are they going to be in the series? Mm-hmm. Ooh, oh, I, I hope kind of not. Hope not. Yeah. I hope oh, not. No, 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 no. <laughs> but they're they're going to be invoked somehow. That's so true. This will be interesting. And we do have that one shot. That one. That one shot with the trees. You know, yeah. flying and thing. We're going to find out. Uh. <laughs> so, but uh, but that will be our subject for next time, and a good one it is. So uh, that'll be in a month's time, and we will take it from there. So we hope you've enjoyed listening as always. We always appreciate your comments and thoughts. Um, we've been getting more of them recently. We absolutely appreciate them all. Thank you very much, whether you're contacting us by email or other means. Um, as always, information about where to find us and the Patreon and things like that uh, can be found in our show notes and at the end bit right here. So enjoy well that. We will talk to you next time. Until then. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.